And uh, as far as uh, my wife and I, my wife Mary can stand again. I introduced her this morning, but uh, uh, life <laughs> uh, life scan of bodies in the museum here. Uh, Mary was the first uh, uh, curator at the ICR Museum when it was in this location. First full time, Karen Jensen got it started. Uh, we have a real heart uh, for children's ministry and uh, their faith and dependence on God's Word as the surest guide to understanding God's world and the human heart and our place in it. Boy, oh boy, we really need to do all we can to support that. Well, unfortunately, that's not the way I began my life. And so to start with, uh, I was a fanatical evolutionist. And so I would uh, have a class, you know, I taught college for over 30 years, and to start with, I'd come into a class, you know, well, uh, I know some of you, you know, think you're Christians or believe the Bible, but I just want you to know you can believe what you want, but it was not the plan, purpose, special acts of a creator God that brought us into being. It was millions of years of struggle and death, struggle and death for millions of years, millions of years of struggle and death. And, uh, that's what brought man and all the other creatures into being. And of course, I was following the lead of that famous evolutionist, uh, Charles Darwin. Now, in those days, uh, and as you see it on TV, you get kind of a, a magical presentation of evolution. It sounds so good that many t Christians are tempted to believe it. it. It sounds like step by step, upward, onward progress, maybe something God would do. But this is the way Darwin summarized his own theory in the closing paragraphs of his famous book, Origin of Species. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death. That's what evolution is all about, the war of nature, famine and death. Well, if you started this sentence that way, you know, what would happen as a result of the war of nature, famine and death? Things would get worse and worse. Things would run down. You know, he'd want to do something to stop and set things right again. But Darwin came to the opposite conclusion. As you just heard from Dr. John, almost every idea the evolutionists had is exactly the opposite of what really is going on. He put it this way, thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, things get better and better and better. The production of higher animals directly follows. If you just have enough death, if you just have enough struggle, you know, single cell creatures will change into fish and fish will climb out on the land and become frogs and some of them will become reptiles and, and mammals and some will climb into trees and become chimpanzees and they'll, they'll jump down and become people. All you have to do is wait. Struggle and death, that's the key to success. And so keep in mind, I, all of you probably have uh, you know, friends who really say, well, I'm a Christian, but I can believe in evolution too. You really need to know what evolution is all about. And I said this over and over so much to my classes, they finally abbreviated it TCSD, time, chance, struggle, and death. Hey, if you believe in evolution, that's what you're saying. I believe time, chance, struggle, and death makes things better and better and better and better. And of course, once in a while, I would have a Christian uh, that would uh, you know, say, well, you don't have to be that hard on the Bible. You don't have to be that hard on Christians. After all, you can believe in the Bible and evolution at the same time. And lots and lots of uh, people have fallen for that because they don't really understand what evolution is. So I really encourage you to learn about evolution. I'm convinced the more you know about it, the less likely you are to believe it. <laughs> so a Christian would say, well, you don't, you don't have to be that hard on, on, on Christians. After all, you can believe in the Bible and evolution at the same time. And I'd say to him, what? Who'd want to pray to a God that wiped out 99.9% .9 of all the species he ever created? Who'd want to pray to a God that made one mistake after another, buried all his mistakes in the ground, and turned to the fossils, and hoped nobody'd ever find him? Besides that, aren't plan and purpose and time and chance and logical opposites? You don't know the Bible, you don't know science, either one. I was actually harder on the Christians that tried to put the Bible and evolution together than I was on those that at least stood for what the Bible clearly says. And I challenge them that way. Uh, you know, don't you Christians believe that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to conquer struggle and death, to bring new life? Well, if God has been using struggle and death for millions of years to make everything better, Jesus Christ is ruining God's plan. He's stopping the process that God has been using for millions of years. You don't even understand the Bible, let alone science. 
And so it's a very confusing idea and it produces a very confused result. And all of us are surrounded by lots of confused people. And we have a real opportunity to help straighten them out, point them to the truth of God's word. Well, how did I find out about that? Well, I wasn't looking for God. Little did I know he was looking for me. And so uh, I began my college teaching career as a chemistry professor. Noticed that my wife and I you know, didn't go to church and do things like that. So he invited us to his home for Bible study. Well, I thought that was silly. Why would anybody in a scientific age want to study the Bible? But I went anyway. Why? What are the secrets of effective evangelism? You might want to write this down. Okay, free coffee and donuts. All right, okay. So, uh, that was the lure that God used to get me into that Bible study. And so since I was going to Bible study, I thought, what? Maybe I should read the Bible. Why? So I could criticize it more effectively. Isn't that interesting? God works in mysterious ways, doesn't he? And so I opened the Bible, started at the beginning. And boy, oh boy, you know, if you haven't read this, you know, you're new to this and you read that, it tells about a perfect creation, uh, that God created people just eat plants, all of the animals just eat plants. We had free access to the tree of life. Our first parents didn't have to die at all. No death, no struggle, no, obviously no evolution, because struggle and death is what evolution is all about. And so I look at the Bible teacher, I say, well, what's wrong? How can you people believe this stuff? You know, just turn on the, the TV news. You know, fires, floods, famines, plagues, drug drivers, AIDS, virus, the place is a mess. Obviously, the Bible's wrong. What the Bible teachers say, read on. <laughs> and so you only have to read the third chapter of the first book to find out something happened to ruin God's perfect world. It's not God's fault. I bet all of you have had people, you know, come to you and say, well, you know, if there's an all-loving, all-powerful God, you know, why is the world such a mess? Why are there wars and rumors of wars and dump drivers, AIDS drivers, all these other things? Well, it's not God's fault. It was our fault. It was our sin, our rebellion against God. That's what brought struggle and death into the world. God even sent an angel to protect the way to the tree of life so we wouldn't eat of the fruit and live forever. And I thought as a non-Christian, well, that's mean and nasty. You know, he made us to live forever. We make one little mistake. That's why I thought of sin, one little mistake. And, you know, and we have to die. You know, that's, that's just not fair. In fact, the Bible tells us it got so filled with violence and corruption. God didn't want us to live in that state. He had something better in mind. But it got so filled with violence and corruption, God had to destroy that. Ah, it makes me homesick. For the days we lived on Pepper Drive, our daughter still lives there right in the flight path for Gillespie Field. <laughs> I love to lie and write books and watch the planes go by and try to identify them. Anyway, God sent a flood uh, to destroy that first world to give it a fresh start with Noah and those with him on the ark. And so the ark is really a symbol of deliverance from judgment. And the final deliverer is Christ himself. Wow. And so as I looked back over those early chapters of Genesis that I started out to criticize, you know, here it tells about a perfect world that God created, was ruined by man's sin, destroyed by the flood, but is to be restored to new life in Christ. And I started thinking about all those years I've been teaching evolution, millions of years of struggle and death, struggle and death for millions of years, until finally what? Death wins. Uh, there was a TV talk show one time. Two famous evolutionists were on there, and the audience was asking them the questions. What does the future hold? What does the future hold? Well, the, the fossil expert, you know, said, well, it looks like the fate of every species is finally to go extinct. And I believe that will happen to man, too. And the audience all breaks into applause. We, we're all going to become extinct. Okay, that's something to look forward to. <laughs> Then they ask an evolutionary astronomer, what does the future hold? Well, the only thing I'm sure of, next April on the so-called cosmic calendar, the sun will expand and, and the earth will be incinerated. The audience breaks into applause. We, if we're not already extinct, we get burned alive. Yay, let's cheer for evolution. <laughs> and I, 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 kept, I began to think, why was I so enthused about evolution? You know, but you get tricked into thinking it's upward, onward progress, everything is better and better and better. And what's the biggest trick? 
uh, the one who spread uh, Darwin's doctrines uh, was Thomas Henry Huxley. His grandson was on a TV show one time, and they asked him, why did evolution succeed so, so easily, so readily? You know, it came out in 1859, by 1879, it was accepted as a fact, you know, in many places around the world. And why did it succeed? Well, you might have thought that this uh, evolutionist, grandson of uh, the Darwin's bulldog, it was called, would say, well, the evidence was so convincing, any thinking person would have to accept evolution. He didn't say that. He said, why did evolution succeed? Because people used it to justify their ungodly lifestyles. And a lot of you are here to your ready comfort. You know, uh, say that very same thing. You know, people don't want to be close to God because they want their own way. They don't want God's way, even though God's way is a better way than anything we could make up. And so I thought about that. And I thought, well, you know, creation, struggle and death are here, but they're only here for a little while. They weren't here at the beginning. They came from man's sin. They've been conquered by Christ, and Christ is coming again to make a new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. So life wins. I can see why somebody would want to be a Christian. The Bible has a happy ending, just like all those other fairy tales. That was a problem. So I know a lot of you have people in your own family, friends that mean a lot to you, and you've told them the gospel, you, you've shared with them the, the good news of new life in Christ, and they say, in effect, no thanks, I'd rather die. Well, why would you choose life, or why would you choose death, when you can have life as a free gift, a free to you, it costs Christ quite a bit, but it's free to you. Why would you choose death over life? Well, we had a fellow at our museum over in Florida, and this is one of the thrilling parts of museum ministry. This is a good place uh, to bring friends, neighbors, families as they're growing up to, to help them understand the creation message. And this was a guy in our little town that uh, we did a radio talk show. He'd call in and he'd always have something about evolution to ask about, you know, and I'd give him an answer and then go on and on and on like that. Well, when we opened our museum over there, uh, you know, he came to see it. And of course, I'd only heard him on the radio, and so I didn't know who he was. And he always looked around. He says, well, this is an interesting museum. And I said, well, I'm, I'm Gary Park. Well, I'm Art. I said, hi, Art. He said, oh, you know, Art from the radio. I'm the guy that's always telling you about evolution, telling you how long the Bible is. And uh, he said, but, you know, I have to admit, you've got a good story here. And then he said, I think you'd have a better life if you just pretended to be a Christian. And I said, well, you don't have to pretend. You really can be a Christian. You know, I started explaining. No, no, no. He says, I've heard it all before. And I bet many of you have that same experience. They've heard it all before. There's no point in telling them anything. They already know what it is. But why, why can't you accept it? Well, evolution. Evolution is proven. There is no God. It would be great if this was true in life wins and Christ rose from the dead and he could save us and the Holy Spirit could empower us to live a wonderful life. But there's just no God. Jesus was just another monkey that fell out of a tree. You know, he did better than most of us, but, you know, it just doesn't have any power. And so keep in mind, don't misunderstand me here, but when we talk about creation, evolution, science in the Bible, it's not a side issue. It's a central issue up front, right in the middle, salvation issue. Now take heart, I don't mean you have to study DNA and fossils and genetics and <laughs> geology and all these things before you can become a Christian, that's, that's not it. Uh, but it's the same problem Paul faced in the first century. And so he had to warn Timothy about this, his spiritual son. He had warned him to avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of what? Science falsely so-called, the perfect definition of evolution. Science falsely so-called, because people who believe in evolution, science falsely so-called, it's just humanism dressed up in a lab coat. They miss the mark. They've erred concerning the faith. It's a stumbling block that even keeps them from listening uh, to the message of Christ. I had people witness to me when I was an evolutionist. And I was kind of a polite person anyway, so I Look, let my eyes look at him when my mind went on thinking about other things. <laughs> I wasn't seriously thinking about anything they were saying. 
if somebody invited me to church, you know, I didn't ask, do you preach the word of God there? I'd say, no, do you, do you have a coffee shop? Do you guys go on field trips? Do you have a tennis court? <laughs> Things that's why I feel like all of you could get out of church. So it's a central salvation issue, a stumbling block that keeps people from even thinking that God and Christ are real. And notice it is science falsely so-called. And this is one thing I want to really, really emphasize. Science is not. Science is not, 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 not the enemy of the Christian faith. Science is a Christian's ally in its battle with evolution. And so what, what science? Science is one of the things that attracted me to science. Science deals with real things you can touch and feel and weigh and measure and study. And you call other people over to look at the, the same things. And, you know, and you could do experiments. In fact, I met my wife, as I think I told some of you this morning, in chemistry class, you know, 55 years ago. <laughs> and we're still, and <laughs> chemistry is still great. You know? you know, science is one of my favorite things. Science is not a problem, but evolution is not science. They use scientific vocabulary to trick you. Okay, that's what they're doing is tricking, suppressing the truth, hiding the truth. And so science deals with things you can see and touch. What's evolution? A belief about the past. And so evolution is not science, never was science, never will be science, never could be science. It's a belief about the past when, according to their view, there were no uh, people there to make scientific observations or reportings at all. And it's not really trying to make and use theories to benefit mankind like science does. It's a, a way of explaining the universe without God. It's got a philosophical goal, uh, you know, that points toward, you know, man controlling man, not God, not each person following God. And so it's a falsely called science. And you've seen many of those evidences as we've gone along. See, I thought, and many of your friends, you know, think the choice of, believe science, science is rock. Now, real science is rock hard. Real science is based on observation. Real science does reach conclusions based on tests that other people can repeat. But that's not a problem. That kind of science supports the Bible. So it's not a contest between science and the Bible. The contest is between evolution and the Bible. And science is our friend. Science helps expose the errors of evolution and confirms evidence of creation. Science is the Christian's ally. And all of the things that evolutionists believed when I was in high school have all been disproven by scientists. Scientists have been our friends in that. And what they've discovered supports, and you've seen that in talk after talk after talk by those speakers, supports what we, uh, scripture says. Well, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, this is one of my favorite evidences for creation, is those birds that make their living banging their heads into trees. Okay, the ones we call woodpeckers. Now, in our home in Florida, we actually have a nesting pair of these pileated woodpeckers. They're about this big, great big woodpecker. <laughs> and they, they fly in kind of a loping pattern like that and so on. Well, if you're gonna bang your head into trees, you know, to get your lunch, you better have a heavy-duty skull, a heavy-duty bill, some shock-absorbing tissue between the two of them. When a woodpecker hits a tree to drill a hole, this deceleration is a, a thousand times gravity. You now, when the astronauts take off into space and come back, they only experience three to five times gravity. <laughs> and so the, it has to be perfect nerve uh, connections for a dead-on hit, a slip to the left or right, and the shearing force would literally spin the cover off the brain. Well, now, where did woodpeckers come from? Now, I can't believe I once taught this as the fact of evolution. Russ Miller did a real good job with some related ideas here. According to evolution, you always start with something simpler. So you don't start with a woodpecker. You start with an ordinary bird. And so just imagine it for a moment. Here's an ordinary bird. It's not adapted for drilling. It's just flying along, minding its own business. Sucks. It gets hit with a cosmic ray. The first step in evolutionary progress is damage to DNA. And there are cosmic rays going through our bodies all the time. <laughs> and they're responsible for cancers and, you know, and other radiation responsible for skin cancer and things like that. They do make changes in DNA, but they make defects, diseases, and disease organisms. 
Yes, yeah, so that's kind of a bad start, but we'll say this is one of those lucky mutations. Even though they've never given an example, evolutionists believe that once in a while one of these cosmic rays will make a good change. So here's a bird flying along, Zox gets hit by a cosmic ray. Well, it turns out it was a mother bird, and she's carrying an egg. She's just about to lay this egg, and that cosmic ray goes through her body, but it hits a DNA, a gene in a little baby bird, and the little baby bird is born just by chance, just by that accidental damage to DNA of mutation, uh, he's born with a heavy-duty bill. He decides to try it out. Oh, whack! Throws his head into the tree. Well, his bill is okay, but squishes in the front of his face. He's still got that thin skull, like a massive cerebral hemorrhage. One dead bird, the end of evolutionary story. Now you know why evolution is so slow, don't you? It's all those dead birds at the bottom of the tree. <laughs> well, an evolutionist might say, no, 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 you got it backwards, you got it backwards. The first lucky mutation, it was, it was a heavy duty skull, that's what came first. Okay, so rewind, M mama bird flying along, socks gets hit with a cosmic ray, little baby birds born with a heavy duty skull. Whack, throws it into the tree. This time the skull is okay, but crinkle, 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 the bill all falls up like an accordion. Uh, you, you get nowhere unless both of those things happen at the same time. Well, after death gets in the world, it's even worse than that. And so nowadays, woodpeckers are not just drilling holes to store acorns, they're looking for beetles in the bark. And so, of course, the beetles hear all this pounding, so they just crawl further down their tunnel. And so now, the woodpecker needs something else, a long, sticky tongue. Well, if you get a long, sticky tongue just by chance, well, what are you going to do with it? Here it is dangling out of your bill, you know, hop along the ground, you trip over your tongue, that's got to be irritating. And, you know, flying along over a low twig, your tongue wraps around a twig, you hang yourself. <laughs> it's a real hazard. <laughs> the answer for the woodpecker is to slip that long tongue into a sheath that wraps all the way around the skull under the scalp and inserts into the right nostril. And so, but notice there'd be a problem here, wouldn't there? There'd be no reason to have a big tongue sheet like that without a tongue put in it. It'd be dangerous to have a tongue, long tongue without a tongue sheet. And so we're right back to that question, which came first? What's the answer? God came first. If you design a woodpecker from the beginning, you put the parts together to accomplish your purpose, that makes sense. You can't do it one step at a time. Darwin himself, said that my theory would be completely disproven if there were any structure in a living thing that couldn't be put together by time, chance, struggle, and death, by one little step, each separate step, having its own survival value. Well, his theory's actually been disproven tens of thousands of times by the features of all kinds of living organisms. And, uh, well, some of those things are in this book, Creation, Facts of Life, uh, this is an expanded version of my testimony, all the arguments I used to use for evolution, uh, how the rest of the story points away from evolution toward the biblical concept of creation. It's not just creation in a vague sense, it's the gospel message, God's perfect world, creation, ruined by man's sin, corruption, destroyed by the flood, catastrophe, restored to new life in Christ. But I start off you know, telling what I used to believe about evolution. So the idea is to get someone who's not a Christian yet. You know, I haven't really thought about this. I tell the evolutionary story, and everybody's heard that, so, you know, they can nod, yeah, yeah, I see it. And I say, well, I went to this Bible study, and I thought that was crazy, but I tell them what the Bible says, and I said, I know it's crazy, but I'm gonna go ahead and see, see what we can make out of this. And, and so I started looking. Well, it, it doesn't say it till the very end. The first chapter is evidence of creation including that woodpecker. And then the second chapter, what about Darwin? What about all this struggle and death? You know, that really does happen. There really are mutations. There really is struggle and death. How'd that happen? Well, that's corruption. That's what man said. That, well, fossils, where do they fit in? Well, that's the story of Noah's flood. And so you tie it all together in the end, but the end isn't Noah's flood. The end is deliverance in Christ, and we can have a share in that salvation. And so I thought, boy, oh boy, Finally, this was a three-year battle <laughs> I had with this chemistry teacher over creation and evolution. Finally, after three years, I realized the evidence, was, you just couldn't stand up to the evidence anymore. Evolution just didn't have any evidence for it, and creation had all kinds of evidence. 
And so I said to myself, I need to tell this to my students. Oh yeah, I forgot one of the details. All those early years when I was preaching evolution, running down the Bible, ridiculing the Christian faith, I was teaching at a, are you ready? Christian college. Now, not Clearwater Christian, but I taught my last 10 years in Florida. It's certainly not Christian Heritage or San Diego Christian uh, here in town. Uh, but I was teaching at a Christian college. If you were surprised, so was I. The only reason I went for the job interview was a free, all expenses paid weekend vacation for my wife and I. It never dawned on me that they would hire me. So, you know, as I looked around and, and boy, they said, well, would you like to work here? 85 acre wooded campus, three beautiful lakes. I, well, yeah, I said, but you know, I'm not a Christian. And I said, well, do you use Jesus Christ as a swear word? And I said, well, no, I don't really do that. And say, well, okay. I said, but you've got a statement of faith. I don't even know what these words mean. Well, are you opposed to any of them? I don't know, I don't know what they mean. I said, well, it's just a form we go through. You can just sign them in the fall. <laughs> And so you don't care? Oh, no, that's fine. You've got all the right academic background and credentials and awards in biology. So I signed up. <laughs> well, after about three years of teaching, running down the Bible, ridiculing Christians in a Christian school, I became a Christian. And I thought, boy, oh, boy, the other school's going to be excited about this. They were excited, all right. I got challenged to a debate by the Bible department. And so at this particular Christian school, and I wish I could say this was rare, uh, the Bible department was teaching the Old Testament. It was a, a series of Babylonian myths and fables like that Gilgamesh epic. Some of you heard John Morris talk about that, you know. And, and so they were running down the Bible in the Bible classes. So they were happy to have me, you know, as an evolutionist. Uh, but there were three of them and only one of me. So they didn't want me to have the underdog sympathy. They said, you get some people for your side. And so I got the chemist who led the Bible study. And then I got a new biologist that they hired, uh, Alan Davis. He's the one that introduced me to that revolutionary book, The Genesis Flood by Henry Morris. And so here was the great debate, the Bible department defending evolution, the science department defending creation. <laughs> that was enough to a little light up in the Philadelphia Bulletin. Well, why would anybody want to compromise millions of years of struggle and death with planned purpose and special acts of creation. Why would anybody want to compromise the, the culture of death, millions of years of struggle and death till death ones with new life in Christ? And there are probably uh, three major reasons. Inconsistent assumptions of great age, and you've heard some comments on that today. Mistaken beliefs about fossils, that's what we focus on in our museum. Misunderstanding change through time. And uh, so there are all of these kind of things that have, have led people away from a clear and simple exposition of Scripture. Uh, and, you know, time has been the biggest problem for most people. Think, boy, oh boy, if I have lots of times, I can explain anything. No, if you have lots of time, you can explain hardly anything. You can't explain the Tapete Sandstone, how Grand Canyon formed, where the ice came from that also produced storms in Florida. Lots of time produces lots of problems in science. Sometimes things only happen if they happen rapidly on a large scale. In geophysics class, I studied firsthand the radioactive decay dating methods. And one after another, you know, they just disproved what evolution has said. Uh, we, my wife and I once flew over the lava dome at Mount St. Helens, that volcano in Oracle, Washington. You know, and when the photograph was taken, you see the bottom of the airplane, I mean, it was just 20 years old, it was still glowing red. I thought, boy, oh boy, you know, if the volcano goes off now, I could get a really good picture. <laughs> well, praise God, it didn't go off right then. <laughs> well, you do a radioactive decay date with potassium argon, and that 20-year-old uh, lava dome dates at 2.4 million. I mean, these are just ridiculous things. Uh, this specimen called Lucy, uh, you know, had so many different conflicting dates about it that an editor from Science News wrote it up under this title, Lucy, the trouble with dating an older woman. <laughs> and Mary Leakey said, well, you know, they just give us this date and another lab gives us another date. They were just all over the place for the dates because there's no science to it. It's just a matter of opinion. Why would anybody respect it? radioactive age dating. Well, it looks like it ought to work on paper. The problem is in practice. 
Okay, we don't know how much uh, sand there was on the top of the hourglass to start with. We do know the decay rate can change. Several factors can do that. We do know that things can be added and subtracted. You can take a, with a lead line glove, you know, take a chunk of uranium ore, put it in a lead line sink, turn on a faucet, the next morning it'll be millions of years older just because uranium dissolves more easily uh, in uh, the uranium nitrate than uranium chloride does. And so just think, or than lead does. And so just things like that throw these off. And uh, carbon-14 is building up in the atmosphere, but it's not even full of atmosphere. A famous uh, evolutionist writing the book, The Science of Evolution, by an evolutionist for evolutionists at Cal Poly, just to the north here a little bit, uh, had to admit he had a dozen different evidences for a young Earth in a book about evolution. And he says creationists are right. Carbon-14 has not yet reached its equilibrium rate. The age of the atmosphere must be less than 20,000 years old. <laughs> and how did he explain it? I actually spoke in his class. He was gone, so they got me as a free substitute. Uh, but the student said he's very fair about this stuff. And so his solution, it's possible a greater concentration of water vapor existed. That would slow down carbon-14 production. When did we have more water vapor in the atmosphere? Prior to the biblical flood. His phrase with a capital B right there in an evolution textbook, presumably about 5,000 years ago. What do I say? Amen, brother, preach it. So right there in an evolution book, you see all this evidence uh, that tells us that this method can't be trusted. When we were reviewing these in the, uh, in the class on radioactive decay data, the prof told us, you know, if a Bible-believing Christian ever got hold of all this, he'd make havoc out of the dating system. And so he told us, keep the faith. Keep the faith. At bottom, that was all there was to evolution. Of faith, the facts have failed. At bottom, that was all there was to radioactive decay dating. Of faith, the facts have failed. Now, uh, the Bible's based on faith, too, but it's a faith, faith that fits the facts. It puts them together in a pattern of meaning. Makes it hard to believe in evolution easy to believe the Bible. Just imagine, say you, you've got a friend, you know, and uh, this friend, you know, actually is, uh, you know, a high-powered physicist, and he teaches at a university, and he understands radioactive decay dating and cosmology and starlight and time and all this, and you've been witnessing to him about the Lord, and you know, one time you just go over there and you say, I know you have your opinion, I have my opinion, but, you know, let, never mind our opinions for a minute. I just want to ask you, as a scientist, as a scientist, can you tell me how old is the Earth anyway? Just what can you tell me as a scientist? What would a scientist say? Now, an evolutionist would tell you, uh, you know, the universe began 13.4 billion years ago, the Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago. An evolutionist would say that, but what would a scientist say? You know, very few scientists are evolutionists. Most scientists are scientists. That was why it was so hard to get a debate. You ask a scientist, well, we have a Christian that wants to debate creation and evolution. Are you willing to explain that? Well, I had evolution when I was in college, and I guess it's true, but I don't really, I never use it. I, that I, I couldn't really explain it or defend it. Politicians, lawyers, now they have 100% <laughs> uh, you know, uh, belief in evolution, but scientists are pretty skeptical about it. And if you ask a scientist, you might say, well, you're right, I have my opinions. But if you're asking me as a scientist, what can I tell you about the science? I gotta tell you, I don't have a clue. As a scientist, I study things I can see in the present, I can measure. Other people can make the same measurement, make the same observations, repeat my experiments, see if they get the same answer. It's all about understanding the present, looking for patterns of order, looking to understand processes that predict the behavior of nature. We can test to see if our, our predictions come true. You're asking me a question about the past. I'm a scientist, I'm not equipped to study the past. I don't even know how, I never even heard anything about that. If you just really have to know how old the earth is, what you need to do is find a reliable witness out there that just up and tells you, what's the Christian God? <laughs> the history book of the universe. It's not only written by reliable witnesses, uh, who saw what happened, it was done by God himself who made it happen. <laughs> and he tells us in clear, simple language that even a Harvard professor can understand. <laughs> I did it in six days at the dawn of human history. I gave you the ability to add and subtract, count up the ages of the patriarchs, it ties into human history, 
you're going to come up with a date about 6,000 years. You can do it on your own. And so why have we got it? It comes down to who you're going to trust. Well, I've written 17 books uh, so far. I'm working on the 18th right now. And my wife is co-author on several of these. Marvin Ross, stand up Marvin, <laughs> is an author on several of these. And one of my greatest accomplishments for ICR was getting Marvin here. <laughs> you guys have been treated to his artwork on your tours of the museum. So who are you going to trust? Well, I've written 17 books, but they've all had to be rewritten, be revised and updated. And you know, I keep a few science books around from when I went to college for the humor value. You I mean I once believed that? Oh, you know, what, what was I thinking? The Bible never had to be rewritten once. God got it right the first time. And so that's the one we really ought to trust, is God's Word. Right? Are there millions of years in the Bible? Well, this may surprise you a little bit. I'm going to tell you there are millions of years in the Bible. Not, not millions of years in the past, filled with struggle, death, disease, disaster, and decline. Where do you find millions of years in the Bible? In the future. Not the past filled with struggle and death and dead things. In the future, filled with peace and joy in a restored relationship with our risen Lord. Now there's millions of years you can believe in. <laughs> a lot of you know the hymn, you know, when we've been there 10,000 years bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began. When we've been there 10 million years, 10 billion years. Uh, Dr. Morris uh, said this to me one time. Now this isn't a direct quote from scripture, but Dr. Morris is about as close as you could get. You know, think about this for a minute. There's one command we've really done a good job of obeying. Multiply and fill the earth, okay? And so, you know, if no man hadn't sinned, it wouldn't be that long before Adam and Eve, who would still be alive, you know, would come to God and say, you told us to multiply and fill the earth, we, we've pretty well done that. And of course, that includes that scattering out, moving into different environments that Randy Belus had talked about. And so we've done that. What do you want us to do now, Lord? And this was just what Dr. Morris shared with me one time, his thought, God would just point out of the depths of space. And he'd say, then we'd have, you know, a nearly infinite amount of time to explore a nearly infinite amount of space to learn a nearly infinite amount about our absolutely infinite God. Now that's the millions of years you really want in your life. And I hope everything we've said, everything you've seen here encourages you to take God to this word and then I'll live in your heart and lift you into eternity. Well, shall we pause for a word of prayer as we close out the conference then? Father in heaven, I thank you so much that you brought people into my life that, that changed me from that path that leads to death and not a death of oblivion, but a death in hell. And you put me on that path that leads to new life in Christ, love and learning that never, never dies. And so we ask, Father, and I'm sure all those have put together the conference and, and Tom Cantor that, that helped to get this whole museum started, all the volunteers, that's what we want. That out of the things you see, do here, that you'll be able to share these with others that will bring them into eternal fellowship, friends for millions of years, learning an infinite amount about our infinite God and experiencing His infinite love. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, thanks very much.